Well, good morning. Good morning, everybody. We're so happy to have you all here join us today. My name is Daphne Dixon, and I am one member of our task force, Sustainable Fairfield, and we are just delighted to be with all of you here with us today, whether you're joining us live or watching the recording. Thank you so much for joining us for our Green Wheels webinar series. The Green Wheels webinar series is part of a much larger event called the Green Wheels Expo. The first Green Wheels Expo was in 2014, and our task force wanted to do an event to support National Drive Electric Week. So over the years, our Green Wheels Expo has grown to be one of the, the largest National Drive Electric Week events in the entire country. It's the largest in, in Connecticut and one of the largest in the regions. And um, it's just so important that we have these events to educate people on the, the opportunities for electrification. So um, I would like to really thank all of the members of Sustainable Fairfield who have, have put so much time and effort into our Green Wheels Expo event. So our Green Wheels Expo event actually kicked off on Saturday and has been, been going on for seven days. But I'd just like to take the time to thank all of our task force members. It's been 100% commitment from, from this group of people I'd like to thank Ron Blumenfeld, Becky Bunnell, Kirsten Chow, Mary Hogue, Larry Cayley, our Chairman Emeritus, Peter Krauss, Rabab Hussein Syed, Syed, William Levy, Phil Leviv, Jim Marin, Jim Modavalli, Sean O'Sullivan, Scott Thompson, our Chairman, and Bob Wall. I want to thank them all. I also want to give a special thank you to Dustin Madre, who is not on our task force, but has been an amazing volunteer and has done our website and we would not have been able to do Green Wheels Expo without Dustin. I also wanna thank our sponsors of the Green Wheels Expo. We could not have done our Green Wheels Expo without our sponsors, Maritime Chevy, William Levy Architects, Techno, the Electric Vehicle Club of Connecticut, Mo Green, Sustain, Pure, Greater New Haven Clean Cities Coalition, Connecticut Southwestern Area Clean Cities Coalition, and Live Green. So this year, we have decided to do a virtual event. So as I was saying, the Green Wheels Expo, is, it's been a seven day event and we kicked off our Green Wheels Expo on Saturday and task force member Jim Motivalli had a tremendous interview with Carbeth J. Leno. And if you wanna watch that interview, you can go to our website, sustainablefairfield.org and you can watch the replay of that interview. Also on Saturday, September 26th, we kicked off our EV showcase. So you can go to our website and you can see all the cars that are available for purchase right here in Connecticut. You can see images of the car, the stats, all the information you need to know about cars that are available for purchase in Connecticut. Our task force members did a great job of putting all that information up there. And we wanna thank them so much for that. On Sunday, we partnered with the Electric Vehicle Club of Connecticut and they hosted an EV car parade. It was magnificent. We started in Westport and we drove through and we ended in Fairfield. And um, you know, Westport is doing such a great job with EVs. They have 527 EVs registered in their town. Fairfield has 413 registered in, in our town. And also um, Fairfield is really leading the way with um, with infrastructure, with charging infrastructure. Fairfield has 22 charging lo locations throughout, um, throughout the town. If you wanna know more about where charging stations are in your town, anywhere in Connecticut or anywhere in the entire country, you can go to afdc.energy.gov and look for the charging um, station locator and you can find charging stations anywhere. So that driving an EV is just as easy as driving a regular ICE car. So it's no problem anymore. We can always, always find a place to get a charge. So um, we had, you know, we had this great interview with Jay Leno. We have our EV showcase. We um, did this amazing car parade. And then on Monday, we kicked off our Green Wheels webinar series. So we started, we started the week off with a discussion on how is Connecticut going to get to 125,000 EVs by 2025. So we had um, Tracy Babich talk about, you know, the, you know, the MOU. So there's a memorandum of understanding from 2013 and then also the, the ZEV Alliance agreements that commits Connecticut along with several other states across the country and with countries across the world to commit to electrification.
electrification and our commitment in Connecticut is 125,000 vehicles by 2025. Also, we had Josh Kirstenbaum of Maritime Motors. They are actually taking delivery of 30 EVs this fall. So if you wanna get behind the wheel and take a, take a drive in an EV, go to Maritime Motors and they will have 30 vehicles to choose from. We also had Anthony Chirolis from the Cheaper Board, and he talked about different incentives that, um, that are available. Now, there's another MOU that was signed by Governor Lamont on July 14th of this year. That is a commitment with 14 other states and the District of Columbia that commits us to 30% electrification of our medium and heavy duty trucks and buses by 2030. So we thought we should really feature our own Bridgeport. So Bridgeport is now the home of two Patera electric transit buses. So they are there, they are ready to hit the, hit the streets. And we had Doug Holcomb of Greater Bridgeport Transit talk about these amazing buses and there's more to come. If you wanna hear that, that interview and, and, and see that presentation, it's amazing. Please go to sustainablefearful.org and watch the replay and it's, you'll, you'll just be amazed at, at everything that's going on there. And there's more, there's more electric transit buses to come. On Wednesday, we talked with Joe Gwynn of Motor Power Systems about how can our businesses go electric? And he gave us some tips on how community leaders can actually help businesses do that. So again, please go to our website and watch that replay and learn how you can get involved with that. On Thursday, we, we dove into how do we, how do we electrify our municipal fleets? And we had the great fortune of having Andrew Berman from Argonne National Labs. And he talked about um, a fleet analysis tool that really can help municipalities take that next step. And it was just um, amazing to have him, have him with us. He's a, a principal environmental scientist for Argonne National Laboratory. And he, invent, he created this A fleet tool and it's incredible. And you can see his presentation. It's on sustainablefairfield.org. And then now it's today, Friday, and we are focused on electric school buses. Now, as part of that MOU that we talked about a little while ago, Connecticut's, Connecticut has about 8,100 um, school buses across the state. So our goal for Connecticut is 2,431 electric school buses by 2030. That's about 237 a year. So we, we have a ways to go now. We've got one in Middletown, but we have we have a ways to go. So um, we're so excited to be here today to talk about electric school buses. And what makes it so special really is a year ago, um, we had our Green Wheels Expo and we worked with Joe Picciano and the wonderful people at White Plains School District and Sergio Alfonso. And um, we were doing our Green Wheels Expo and we wanted to have an electric school bus at our event. And um, one of our task force members, Jim Modavalli, had read an article about White Plains. And he said, well, you know, maybe we should get, maybe we should see if, if, if those folks would drive their bus over to our Green Wheels Expo. So we called them up and they couldn't have been nicer. And um, the range on the bus is, uh, 65 miles and uh, about, and um, the, the route from White Plains to Fairfield's a little over 30 miles. Um, so we talked, it, we talked with them and um, we said, you know what, we have a charger. We have a level two charger right on location. So if you drive your bus over, you can charge it up. And, and while people are getting on the bus and looking at it, you will be able to charge up that bus and you will get home safely. And they said, that sounds great. So they came. We had our decision makers from our town get on the bus. We had decision makers from, from the region come and get on that bus. And I will tell you, having that bus and, and having, that, having that available for people to, to experience what electric school bus was like has been a catalyst for Connecticut. It actually prompted the development of a program called the Electric School Bus Toolkit Program. And that program has enlisted over 30 school districts in their interest in electric school buses and has them inquiring, talking with their service providers and really wanting to go forward with electric school buses. And there's, there's over a dozen school districts now that are, that are actively working with their school bus providers on, on grant funding. And um, you know, it really goes back to um, that a year ago when we had that bus show up 
and and I just I can't thank White Plains enough um, and Lion Electric for for facilitating that and um, and being such a catalyst for change here in Connecticut. So um, thank you so much for your leadership. And um, without further ado, I would love to turn this over to the stars of the show today. And that is the electric school bus. And I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Maggie Clancy of Durham School Services to, um, to take it away. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Daphne. It's such a privilege to be with you and everyone else on this call and watching um, hopefully later this afternoon. Um, you know, we just, we're excited to just share our story really because I know that for many of you just have questions in terms of how do we even get started? And so what we did was we pulled together all of our really important partners who helped us bring this to life in White Plains. And so what we'll do is we'll kind of go through how we got started from uh, the school district perspective with Sergio, who's the uh, transportation director. Um, we'll talk through our strategic partners from vehicle to grid, Lion, uh, Con Ed from a utility perspective, as well as our operators. And then Sergio will round us out in terms of what our ambitions are for the future. So I'm gonna step out and let the experts go to work. Um, Sergio, if you wouldn't mind kicking us off. Thank you. Sure, Maggie, thank you, I'm, and I'm happy to. So thank you all for, for allowing me to be with you all today. Um, you know, if I'm being honest, I, I believe that I'm just the, the beneficiary here of this wonderful initiative. Credit to, to Mr. Baker and his team who really just approached the school district with this program and uh, you know, we've, we've hit the ground running. In a short period of time, we've managed to take this from a pilot program to incorporating the five electric vehicles into our fleet. Um, the White Plains School District has always been a progressive school district. One of our school elementary schools that was completed in 2009 was actually deemed the greenest school in New York by NYSERDA. So sustainability has always been at the forefront of the school district's uh, forward thinking. And when you add the element of health and well-being uh, to our students, for our students, uh, it was really an easy sell for me to the decision makers here in, in White Plains. And, uh, you know, I gave a few nudges and kind of pushed the narrative of why not. So I'm just happy to be a part of such a wonderful program. And it's, it's thumbs up for me, really. Hey, Joe, what if uh, Joe Baker, if you wouldn't mind just talking a little bit about the partners that um, once we were approached from the district, how that worked, and then maybe the partners that we brought in to help bring this to life. Yeah, sure. Well, good morning, everybody. And uh, I'm Joe Baker. I oversee the uh, motor coach operations for National Express Transit. So um, Durham School Services is a, a brand of, uh, of National Express in the U.S., and um, I'm excited to be here. Um, just really quick on electric. I, when I was with uh, Hertz rental car, I was a vice president in Los Angeles in 2013. And I got to drive one of the first uh, Tesla Model Xs that actually was manufactured at the plant uh, right by LAX. And uh, at the time, I didn't really know a lot about electric, but I was the first person for the company to drive um, the Model X from Los Angeles to San Diego down the Pacific Coast Highway. And uh, talk about a cool experience to have the, uh, the ocean on the right and, uh, and to drive that vehicle, which made almost no sound uh, for, for almost 200 miles was, was pretty cool. So I, um, you know, since that time, I've, I've become very interested in um, electric. And um, clearly, if you look at what's going on today, I think the progression of um, particularly electric trucks, right, is starting to really uh, reach a tipping point. And obviously vehicles, I think Tesla came out uh, this morning actually and said that they, they sold 140,000 vehicles in the, in the third quarter, which was just an astonishing number. So um, electric is here. And uh, I would tell you, when we started this project uh, with White Plains, actually back in 2017, I'll share a little bit more about how long it took and some of the challenges for that. But um, you know, at, uh, you know, even at that time, there wasn't a lot of information available about electric vehicles, um, not just cars, but certainly school buses. So, uh, you know, I guess I'll start there is why we really did this project. Uh, at the time, National Express was, um, was growing significantly in the U.S. Uh, we had a large school bus portfolio. 
And uh, it actually, it actually, the idea came up over like a breakfast with a couple of us that were just talking about where things were going in the business. And uh, uh, a friend of ours that we still partner with named John Gilly, who uh, runs a, a startup called Truck Tractor Trailer actually pitched this whole idea of like putting partners together. And uh, we had a lunch with Lion, um, uh, myself and Lion back in early 2017. And that meeting really evolved into a, uh, an idea of how do, we, how do we put the first electric buses in New York State? And um, at the time, Lion uh, was, was still pretty small. They had a few buses running in California. But for them, um, you know, obviously this, this would be a big deal. So we went up and toured the plant. Uh, we went up and saw the factory and learned a lot, a lot about the technology. And then we just decided that this was the right thing to do. So the real, the real whys behind this, obviously, we, we had a great um, long history with White Plains School District. We've been partnered for, um, I think it's over 25 years now. So we just thought this was, this was a great opportunity to, uh, to really make the school district um, you know, be on the forefront of uh, this technology and, and how great it would be for the community. And, uh, and that's really where it started. Um, it was an easy sell, as Sergio said. Um, Dr. Ricca, the superintendent, and Sergio were uh, more than able and willing to, to partner with us on this. And, and they were great partners. Um, they were engaged in the process. They really helped us understand what their, uh, what their why and mission was. And we really tried to build the strategy from there with what I call the, the voice of the customer. So it's, you know, it started with us and Lion and then the school district. And then from there, things got really complicated. So I'll give you now the, the, the challenges, um, the kind of the second part of my point uh, is, is really uh, how much we learned about how difficult something like this could be. Uh, there was no playbook in place. No, nobody else had done anything like this before. You know, we were targeting five buses and, um, you know, it, it, things got really complicated when you start to look at, you know, what are the DOT requirements of the vehicle? Um, there weren't really safety protocols around electric vehicles at the time. So we had to do a lot of research to understand what, into that, what went into that. Um, training on the vehicles, right? Like, so this is a new technology we didn't understand anything about. We had to do a lot of research in partnership with Lion to understand what were the key training elements. The performance of a battery, uh, which, which uh, at the time, um, you know, was, was concerning, right? Like, how are we going to charge these things? Are they going to run out of power in the middle of a route? What are the right routes to put them on? So, um, you know, all of this stuff really had to be worked out. So the point I want to make here is this, it, you know, it really re requires leadership. Um, it, it really needs an owner. If uh, you're going to embark along this journey, somebody who can own the project management and who can really bring all the stakeholders together. And um, we did not really have that. <laughs> I spent uh, it on top of my day job. By the end of this, I was probably spending about half of my time uh, just on this deployment. So I, I think the message there, and you're going to hear from some of the great stakeholders today, uh, whether it's a power company that you can partner with on vehicle to, to grid technology, which is a great option. We got funding from that. Uh, we talk about grant writing, uh, you, you know, that's going to be something that will be discussed today. You know, there are grants available, there's money available to do these things, but there's a lot of work and a lot of things that have to be lined up to do that. So I, I think it's critical that those stakeholders are in place. And, um, uh, and, and then the cost is the other thing I want to mention. These, these vehicles are still expensive. I think that's still the main barrier to entry on this is um, the net cost for us was about 50000 above a diesel bus after all the incentives. So um, I think that the real message for stakeholders uh, is to really find solutions is how, how can we do, do this in a way that makes it cost neutral. And I think there are ways to do that if you engage with the right stakeholders and you'll get some of those ideas today. And then the last thing I just wanted to mention is trust, trusted partnerships. I think that's so important. I have uh, extended my network so much uh, broader because of this experience. The, uh, some of the, the team you're gonna meet today uh, we've become lifelong friends. Uh, we've helped each other in other areas of the business. And we definitely have some battle scars from this. So uh, I would just encourage you to take good notes today to listen. And then uh, I also want to extend my help if I can support in any way uh, following this, we can get you my contact information. I'm happy to uh, you know, provide some, some counsel uh, on a call or any other way I can support. So thanks for having us. I look forward to listening. It's very exciting stuff. 
Thank you, Joe. Appreciate that. I think next we're going to hand it over to Brian Ross at Con Ed to talk from a utility perspective. Sure. Thank, thanks, Maggie. Uh, I'm Brian Ross. I, I manage what we call uh, electric vehicle demonstration projects at Con Edison. And, and the White Plains project is, is one of those. Uh, we, we have a, a growing EV program at the utility uh, and, uh, and, and the purpose you know, there is, is kind of twofold. One is supporting transportation electrification um, efforts by the state and, and policies by the state. So Daphne mentioned the, uh, the medium duty and heavy duty zero emission vehicle mandate. New York is part of that. And um, uh, and 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 other 80 by 50 greenhouse gas reduction goals in New York City. So um, you know that that's really driving the the utilities uh, programs around electric vehicles. If I take it back to 2017 when um, we were soliciting ideas for demonstrations, school bus V to G vehicle to grid was one of our um, focus areas. And uh, part of that was uh, policy tailwinds behind the vehicle segment, incentives available for the vehicles, and of, of course, you know, support for cleaning up emissions around school, school children. Um, another part of that is it, it's, it's, a, it's a very large uh, vehicle segment in our territory. There's um, approximately 7,000 school buses in New York City another thousand in Westchester County, uh, New York. So, um, you know, potential to make a significant impact. Um, vehicle to grid was, was uh, uh, as, is an element of the White Plains project and it, it was important for the utility, um, mostly because it, it represents, uh, we, we are a summer peaking system, meaning um, our highest, uh, uh, our highest demand comes during during the summertime in the hours when everyone's running air conditioning, basically. Um, and uh, school buses, for the most part, are not running during the summer. So there's this concept of using it as a sh using the buses as a shared asset, and being able to enable um, a new revenue stream for the bus operators to help complement the lower operating costs of the school bus and improve the total cost of ownership. So overall, just make that impact. So, um, you know, make, make that kind of twofold impact to encourage electrification. Um, and, the, and the other side of that on the utility side is with more distributed resources like school bus batteries and other stationary batteries, solar, other distributed resources we support, um, we're able to effectively uh, lower lower that peak and and be able to avoid kind of other um, system reinforcements that would and, and and by doing so that benefits our entire customer base. Um, proving out the technology through the demonstration and enables you know uh, that those asset school buses for other programs and other incentives that we might come up with to to further encourage you know load relief um, and and lower peak demand so uh, I'll echo what, what what Joe said I think cost um, still a big major barrier uh, and I think the the goal here to show that there is a, a viable revenue uh, stream for the buses and also I could Joe that you know it's been a lot uh, a very important teamwork um, uh, uh, throughout the life of the project. I, I actually inherited this project from another project manager, but, but was working closely with him too, and can say it's, it's taken an effort from, uh, from, the, from the district, from National uh, Express, Lion, maybe everyone you're gonna hear from to, um, to work towards success. Thank you, Brian, appreciate that. Next, we're gonna go to Kevin King from Lion. <laughs> We should be on the ground with actual buses. Just getting you. Not, not yet, Kevin. I know. I'm trying to get you here. There you go. Well, good morning, everybody. And uh, as you can see, we're enjoying a beautiful sunny day here in White Plains, New York. But otherwise, uh, I'm happy to be here. And uh, I, you know, I just want to say 
thanks to, uh, to Joe and Maggie and to uh, uh, everybody who had the foresight to uh, partner with Lion on this project. You guys are truly pioneers, and uh, you know, it, was, it was great for us to get a presence here in New York, and uh, it certainly has helped create an awareness of our product in and around the metropolitan area, and it's hopefully one that we'll be able to expand on. We'll be forever grateful for that. Since the time that White Plains took delivery on this bus, these buses, there's been a few changes. Um, one of which is now Lane. This bus right here, uh, on my right, your left probably, is a 65-mile uh, bus. We now have buses that can go all the way up to 155 miles. We accomplished that through the addition of extra battery packs, which are located on the frame rails of the bus, uh, just underneath where ordinarily we see a drivetrain transition and things of that nature. Uh, the Lion bus is custom made, it's purpose built to be electric. It is not a bus that is being retrofitted from a fossil fuel capacity to handle electric. This is a purpose built electric bus. And if you look at these two buses, they look very much alike. This bus over here is a, a steel frame, a steel body bus. This bus here, the Lion electric bus, is made of a composite material. And, and why we're excited about that is that in areas such as this, uh, the Northeast, I'm so sorry. There's so much feedback going on. Could you turn your phone off? Oh, you turn your phone off. How's that? Thank you. Is that better? Can you hear better? Okay. Way to Thank go, you so much. <laughs> Good Excellent. job. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Technology. Uh, but this is a composite body bus. So when you're putting down the salt on the road and things of that nature, you're not going to have the deterioration. You don't have the similar metals, which can be a deterioration rust points on a bus. The stairwells, which are typically areas of deterioration, are not going to happen. They're all, it's a 100% composite material. So, um, you know, we're very proud of that in our design. We put a lot of thought into the buses. Additionally, this bus is pulled in uh, because the charging port is now in the front. Ideally, if we could go back in time, we would have put a rear charger on this bus because it, it would be better to back these buses in. Wasn't an option at the time. It is an option now. So we're continually improving the buses that we have out on the road. Uh, as we move forward here, Again, you'll look, it seems like it's just they're two similar school buses. If you, were to go in, if you were to go inside the buses, it would appear to be the same, exception of the, the dashboard there. But here is where you see some real change. If you look over here, here is your diesel bus engine. Diesel bus has somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,000 parts. If you look over here on the right, the Lion bus, this is more of a power plant than an engine. There's approximately 28 moving parts on an electric bus. Uh, when people ask me, what is maintenance like on an electric bus? I use the cliche, it's basically windshield wipers, tires, and brakes. And the brakes are a hydraulic brake system. They're the same as what you're using on your, on your fossil fuel bus. One of the elements of this bus as well, though, it has something called regenerative braking. So when you come off of the gas, you don't have to hit the brake, although you will feel a throttling effect like you have hit the brake, but kinetic energy is being fed back into the batteries, enhancing the range on the bus. Uh, we call that hypermiling. It's not uncommon for drivers who are very experienced with an electric bus like this, if it's rated for 65 miles, to get 75, 80, or 85 miles out of the bus, contingent upon their ability to, to, to drive that bus. Um, so again, we're, we're very proud of our relationship here with White Plains. We're very proud of our product. We now have over 300 buses on the road. We have over 6 million miles driven uh, in a normal environment when we're not dealing with the outside challenges we are with schools and everything now. Our buses are, are transporting, transporting students to the tune of about 25 to 30,000 miles each week. And every day that's growing. Um, we have a number of buses on order. Lion is not just uh, a school bus company anymore. Uh, you may have seen, we recently uh, announced a sale of 10, bus, uh, 10 trucks, medium duty trucks to Amazon. So we are expanding everything uh, that we do. We have school bus, we have paratransit shuttle buses, we have light, medium, heavy duty trucks all the way up to a class eight tractor. And Lion's commitment to electric is, uh, is greater now than it's ever been. And we owe a lot of that to White Plains for having the the vision and the, and the guts to step into this product because there was a lot of anxiety. And we'll be forever grateful for that. So that's just uh, one other thing I'd like to include. Uh, Joe talked about training and understanding the product. One of the things we've also since introduced since White Plains took delivery of these buses is what we call the Lion Academy, 
where we'll provide technical training to the technicians, we'll provide driver training, we'll invite first responders in here because it's important that they identify in the event they ever have to deal with an incident with an electrified bus. And we'll also invite DOT inspectors because as was alluded to also by Joe, people don't know what don't know these buses. It's a, it's a new animal to them. So uh, we've learned a lot through the years and we've tried to incorporate all that knowledge as we go forward. And we think we've done a pretty good job and, and uh, life is a lot easier than it used to be. So uh, that's hey. just, that's, that's a quick overview on the Lion Electric bus. Thank you, Kevin. That was great. Appreciate it so very much. Uh, next, we're going to go to Nuvi. We're going to talk with Russell Bear about VGG. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks for the invitation. And um, a really big thank to all the project partners on this one for the, the vehicle to grid application here. We really um, were treading a lot of new ground and um, it included complications like uh, retrofitting existing vehicles and, and what we call an AC vehicle to grid interconnection, which uh, was a, a challenge for both Con Edison to work through and support as well as to enable that configuration. So it's um, a really exciting technology and, and great to have the support from Con Edison. We see other utilities in, in the Northeast that are really supporting being able to uh, use school buses as an energy storage resource, uh, providing value to the grid during peak times. And we're, we're starting to get some support. You know, there's, there's 3,000 utilities across the U.S. So everywhere is a little bit different on how they are approaching um, distributed energy resources and vehicle to grid, but uh, we are finding a, a lot of support and um, making a lot of headway in the technology. Just wanted to say that, um, you know, not every application needs to be bi-directional. You can also, you know, if you're working with uh, school districts or getting first implementations, it, it can be relatively simple to just get a, a level two charging station installed and, and start operating an electric bus. Uh, but there are, you know, some revenue streams available from vehicle to grid that can bring in, um, you know, faster charging like DC charging that can uh, help um, improve the charge times if, if there's a heavy operating cycle and then also provide that extra um, revenue potential with, with partnerships from the utility. So, um, you know, I, I think that the uh, charging solution is uh, really needs to be designed about how the vehicles are being operated. Um, you know, school buses can be fairly simple in terms of they're parked overnight for long hours. So it, it, it doesn't necessarily need the same as, as some of the trucks that Kevin was just mentioning where you might need um, more power. Uh, but as what we've seen is as vehicle fleets start increasing from kind of, you know, one, two, five buses, as you start going up to 10, 20 buses, you do need more charging infrastructure to support um, those operations. And, and so it, it is important to kind of consider the charging and the operation um, early in the process. Um, any, I think that uh, that's kind of, I wanted to just give a quick overview on that, um, but would be happy to come back if there's Q&A on additional questions. Thank you, Russell. Yeah, and I do want to encourage everyone to use the chat function if they have any specific questions. So certainly we've got a great group of experts um, sort of coming together to help answer any questions that you might have. Um, so if you're following along, um, clearly it takes uh, many smart <laughs> individuals coming together and persevering and, and, and tackling some of the challenges. It's certainly not easy, but it's possible. Um, what I'd like to do now is throw it back out to the field to Britt to talk about how things are working today. So now that we've got all of the right people in the room and we've got a plan in place, um, if Britt can talk a little bit from an operator's perspective and maybe some feedback from a driver's perspective as well in terms of what it's like working with electric school buses. Okay, hi everyone. I'm, I'm Britt Leota. I'm the general manager at White Plains. Came in here uh, almost eight months ago and walked in uh, two weeks before COVID hit. So unfortunately, uh, everything went right into shutdown. So I didn't get a lot of experience to get to ride the buses and especially the electric buses. Um, so we're just kind of getting back into things here with school starting up a couple weeks ago. Um, one of the things I do want to show you, which is really neat. Um, excuse me one second. I want to start the bus for everyone, as you can hear it. And this is what I'm looking at. And that's it. Okay, so the bus, the bus is now on, and what you're seeing here on the dash is uh, specifically what 
Kevin was talking to was about our range on the bus. And you're going to see it's coming up quickly to the 65. The bus is fully charged, ready to go. Um, but this is the noise of the bus. And what's really neat is that um, when we run this bus and it's coming out of the gate in the mornings and I'm out there directing traffic because we, we're in a high uh, traffic area. So we go out there for safety. We direct all the buses out. When this bus is coming down, the only way I know that it's actually coming at me is it actually has a, a loudspeaker on it that plays an audible sound because when the bus is traveling at a low speed, uh, it's literally silent. So we, we can't hear it at all. So they have to actually play um, some type of a, a little tune that the bus is traveling at a low speed so that we know that it's out there because otherwise, if you were walking and you were not paying attention, you would not know that there's, there's a vehicle coming up at you and, and especially the size of this thing and you just don't hear it. So um, a couple of things uh, Maggie mentioned about uh, the driver's perspective. One of the things about being a driver and I've driven trucks for many years, I can tell you that one of the things is in New England, especially um, when it comes to the elements, the elements are not forgiving when you're in a larger vehicle. And, and with that being said, um, when you're driving in the snow, one thing about a, a bus in particular is a regular school bus with a diesel engine is it's kind of like a, a ski. Okay. It's very light in the back end. And as soon as it snows, um, every district knows that we have all kinds of issues going on with buses being stuck everywhere. Well, one good thing about these buses is with the battery packs being underneath them, it's throwing a lot of extra weight on this bus. And that helps with the bus in the snow. And I know that in the years that they've run this, last year there wasn't much snow, right? Uh, <laughs> New England got lucky, but the year before we had quite a bit of snow. And everyone has told me that these buses operated excellent in the snow. They were, they were heavy. They were able to maneuver around in the snow, go up and down the hills uh, when it was snowing. Um, the drivers have all told me, and I've, I've had a lot of conversations with the ones that use them, and they've told me that the buses move very well up and down the hills. There's no real loss of power, which a lot of people would say, okay, well, you have a diesel engine versus an electric um, power grid that kind of pushes the bus, there's no loss of power. These things are able to pull hills without issues and with a bunch of students on the bus. So that has never been an issue. Um, to the point of the 65 miles, most of the school routes are probably, you know, 25 to 30 miles doing two or three schools. So the 65 has been very adequate, uh, especially in White Plains to run a route. Um, we've put them on some charters, knowing how far the charter will go and it has not been an issue. So, you know, obviously management at, of the, trip itself is very important for these buses and being that uh, they're now starting to put out vehicles that have a larger range that's outstanding these things run very very well so on the driver end on the operator end listen I've been in business for a very long time doing transportation and I can tell you that this is very exciting to have these types of buses out there that are that are just so much more energy efficient so much more um, it's environmentally uh, safe and environmentally efficient. Um, this is just great news for all of us. And, and I look forward to getting some more here and running some more and, and you know, dealing with the, the um, ground side of the, everything and, and operationally being able to do this. So thank you. Thank you, Brett. I appreciate you and everyone else there. Um, I know it's a busy day for you. School is in session, so. <laughs> And I it's raining. It's New England. And so it's wonderful, raining. Wonderful. Yeah, of course. <laughs> You've got phones going off. So thank you. Um, I so appreciate you doing this and participating and helping to tell the story of what's going on there. Um, it's certainly not easy, but with people like you and the partners that we have, it's certainly possible. So thank you. Great, um, to close us out, I want to hand it back over to Sergio to talk a little bit about where we go from here. Um, from a district perspective, uh, feedback he's gotten um, from the community as well as any future ambitions when it comes to electric school bus. Yeah, thank you, Maggie. So yeah, uh, I think uh, Mr. Baker and, and uh, the team could tell you that I've been called ambitious in the past. Um, <laughs> Daphne and, and a lot of other uh, people that may be on this call have heard me say this before, you know, five school electric school buses are cool, but an entire fleet is cooler. So that's the ultimate goal, <laughs> if, you, if you were to ask me. But um, 
community feedback has been terrific. And that's part of why that goal is, is so ambitious because we, we are, we're in, a, in an industry where we always look out for the safety and well-being of our, of our students. And why not do this to, to focus on the health of our students as well? Um, we're excited. I'm excited to hear now there are vehicles out there that can go up to 150 miles. Um, and that's something that we're going to hopefully expand on. And um, that's it, unless there are any questions. Awesome. Yes, we certainly want to get a whole fleet. And I appreciate your, your ambition and your push and your desire, because quite frankly, um, we need it to come from the communities and the districts as well. We need the push um, and that's what's going to force the change and to make it possible. So all the folks that just spoke um, and there are many more behind the scenes that kind of make this possible. Um, but certainly most importantly from a district perspective, uh, thank you Sergio for being such a good partner to us. Okay, well Daphne, I think I might turn it over to you. If, um, to answer yeah. some questions and then kind of wrap us up from there. That's sure. good. Well, oh my God, what a great day. And I loved being behind the wheel of an electric school bus. Did everybody just enjoy that? That was, um, that was terrific. Absolutely amazing. So we did have a question that came into chat. I think Russell is, is probably going to take it. It has to do with how much power um, per day can one vehicle um, feed back into the grid. So Russell, do you want to I think you take a look at that question and, and sure, I can I can just respond um, to the group. But yeah, the, the way that we designed this pilot project is was each bus has about 13 kilowatts of charge discharge power. Um, there's a possibility with level two charging to take that up to 19 kilowatts charge discharge power per bus. Uh, in other projects around the country, we're looking at higher discharge of um, 60 kilowatts per bus, and then in another pilot project, going all the way up to 125 kilowatts per bus. So as, um, as vehicle batteries get larger and um, as you know, the, the technology evolves, um, more power is available for discharging. Awesome. All right, um, thank you. And there was a question in chat about, um, about the, the diesel heater. I think that comes up a lot. So, um, you know, is, who, who wants to talk about the heaters? Is there a way of, of somehow um, not, not having these heaters in the future or using them less? Or that seems to be a, an issue that people always have a little bit of concern about. And I don't know if that question goes to, 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 um, to, to Kevin or... Well, uh, Daphne, this is Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Hi. Um, yeah, it's... The diesel heater is, uh, the reason we run a diesel heater, an auxiliary heater, and, and we are looking at a cleaner energy alternative. Uh, the NO2 output on this, the CO2 output on the diesel heater is negligible, but still there is the ultimate goal of being 100% electric. Um, we are working toward that. Um, diesel heater though, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the electric heater will consume approximately seven or 8% additional battery per hour of usage which is why the uh, auxiliary diesel heater is a more practical solution at this point. Some ways people have worked around that is if their required range is say 65 miles, they'll look at a 100 to 125 mile bus and uh, they'll have more than enough power at that point to run electric heat and still meet the requirements of the route in terms of range. Terrific. You know, so, um, you know, the one question that I, I, I really have is that, you know, there is, this, there is this memorandum of understanding that all of these states have signed with this commitment of 30% electrification of our buses and trucks by 2030. And as Sergio said, you know, he'd like to see a whole fleet of electric school buses. You know, you've got five and, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot more to go. And so um, I, I guess I'm going to throw it back to Sergio. So you've taken such leadership in this and, and you're such a such a champion for um for electric school buses you know what is it that you can say to other decision makers to other school districts to get to get them to move forward on this because i know like i know in connecticut there's like these 40 or 50 school districts that are you know the, the, there's some decision makers that are interested there's a lot of community members that are intensely committed to this but they're you know there's kind of a 
a hurdle. There's kind of, a, you have to jump to kind of get to that next place of really all in commitment to it. And I, I feel like there's a, a, a awful lot of school districts that, you know, they see the electric school buses and they, they, they know it's the right thing, but they're just, it's, it's, they're just, it's hard for them to take that leap of faith. And I, you know, I guess I'm so in awe of your leadership. And I'm just wondering if you could provide some information or maybe some tips of courage or, or something to these, to these, you know, the other school districts around that are looking at you, looking at you and looking what, what you and this amazing team has done in White Plains, um, you know, for some guidance. Yeah, thank you, Daphne. Uh, and, and going back to what I said earlier, you know, the, the nudge of why not was, was an actual push. Um, you know, of course, we're tipping our, our, our toe in the water and, and uh, getting a feel for the temperature. Let's, let's just jump right in. You know, this is a proven system here in White Plains. Um, look no further. It's, it's now we're going to go into year three of, of our electric buses on the road as part of our fleet. And uh, I know there's some hurdles. I know there's some concerns and some challenges, of course, uh, infrastructure being one of them. But again, here we are. Our buses are plugged in. Um, we're going to look at the metrics, and I'm sure I, we have the metrics now, of what that vehicle to grid uh, data looks like. So I'm happy, uh, and I, I'm happy to take any questions or comments offline. Uh, but as far as encouragement is, this is a proven system. And I think this is the, the future, uh, as, as Joe Baker said earlier, sustainable energy, energy is here, it's here to stay, it's the future. And I saw, I saw the light at the beginning of this and um, I'm not gonna stop until we get an entire fleet. And I have no qualms of, of saying that in front of Mr. Baker and his National Express team, but <laughs> <laughs> Listen, um, it's where we need to go as a society, and um, it's time that you know we make the, the change from a diesel engine that we all know what the fumes can do from a health standpoint to, to a more sustainable uh, transportation, I, I guess. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, the, I... Um, just so inspired by you, and I really appreciate you sharing sharing all that with us. Um, you know, one of the things that we've noticed in in working with a lot of school districts and community members is that when we talk about um, electric school buses, a lot of times folks will say, "Well, you know, we don't own our we don't own our buses. It's you know we have a service provider, um, you know, so it's up to them." And you know, there's there's nothing really. A lot of times, I think community members or school districts sometimes feel a little bit like there's they can't really take the lead on it because at the end of the day it's the it's the service providers that are going to be applying for the grants and owning and buying the buses um and and really doing that so it's it's in a lot of ways you know we need sergios um, but we also need service providers that are committed to this and so i'm going to i'm going to throw this back over to maggie and um could you talk a little bit about the role that the Durham is playing in this? You know, service providers don't have to embrace electric school buses. Um, it, you know, they can see it as a risk. It's a, maybe disruptive to their business model. But can you talk a little bit about uh, Durham's perspective on this? Well, you know, Durham is leaning in because we know that this is the future and it's the right thing to do. And we have. We have a small but mighty team that is solely dedicated on how we bring electric school buses to districts and anyone who really desires it. So uh, we're committed to figuring out the best way to deliver that. And it's probably gonna look a little bit different for every district given the infrastructure needs, given pricing, fleet routes, all of those, all of those requirements are really important to kind of weed through in order to come up with the right solution for the district. Mm -hmm. um, but really what we're hoping that comes out of this is to show that it's possible. And it really just starts with someone raising their hand and saying we're interested. And then from there, we can start the process of really investigating how best to deliver it. Um, you know, we're also committed to figuring out how to get access to grants that are available, but also not create a system that is dependent on grants going forward, because we know that that is, that is a solution for now, but it's not going to be a solution for always. And so we're really focused on how do we do this for the long term? How do we, like Sergio said, not just put one, five buses, 12 buses in, but an entire fleet? 
That is our goal. Um, and our partnerships, our ability to scale will allow us to get there fairly quickly by bringing the right people in at the right times uh, to inform that. So I appreciate you asking that question. Um, you know, we're in the beginning of this. And anyone who has it all says they have it all figured out is lying. <laughs> um, but we're committed to, to doing that and working together with our with our customers in order to deliver it. Terrific. You know, what difference, thank you, Maggie, one difference I see with um, New York and then the, the White Plains project and in Connecticut is uh, in, in White Plains, um, Con Ed really came in and was a, a big partner and, a, a, you know, helped to move the project forward um, in Connecticut. It's, a, it's, you know, it's, it's, we don't have the, the support yet of our utilities in the same way that Con Ed has, is supporting White Plains. That doesn't mean we still can't get electric school buses and figure out ways to, um, to do this. And, um, you know, kind of something Russell said, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to have a V to G project to make electric school buses work. Um, you know, there's a lot of electric school bus programs all over the country and they, they don't do a V to G. So I'm not quite sure who wants to sort of take that question. Maybe it's a little bit of everyone, but you know, how here in Connecticut can we, you know, we, we can't really take the White Plains project and, and put it into Connecticut because it's a, it's a different set of partners really that we're, that we're working with. But how, how do we think that we can do this in Connecticut in a way, you know, that's, that's scalable? You know, like, like Sergio said, you know, five buses is nice, but fleets are, you know, we need 237 buses by next year to stay on track with our goal of 2,434 buses by, you know, 2030. So how can we, how can we start scaling this in Connecticut? How can we get five or 10 buses in a school district and then potentially scale that up without B to G? Well, Daphne, if I could, oh, Russell, I think you were gonna jump in probably yeah. with something much I was, smarter. Than I, was I was gonna just gonna say. say that, you know, from, from our experience in, in um, helping deploy electric buses with partners that uh, sometimes there's a lot of stakeholders here that are, are supportive and the transportation directors might need to be convinced and and sometimes transportation directors or the operators are, are wanting to make sure that the longest route or the hardest route could be supported by electric versus trying to find the maybe the shorter or easier route to start with so I think just as a reminder that you know uh, electric um, you know, there are opportunities today for electric and, and there's still a lot more that can um, be developed both from vehicle to grid and, and um, longer ranges, but there's plenty of opportunities today. Thank you. You know, one of, one of the things that the group has really exemplified today is, is teamwork and partnerships. And, um, you know, there's this program, the Electric School Bus Toolkit program that went on in spring and summer. And, and one of the one of the major components of that program was you got to build your team. You know, you got to build your team. You need the community members, you need the leaders, you need the decision makers in the school, you need service providers, you need the, the bus manufacturers, you need all of these things. You need the utilities, you need, you need all of these things. So, um, you know, I can just, I, this, what you have done here just exemplifies the importance the importance of teamwork. So when this all came about, how long did it take for, for the team to sort of come together for everybody to know their roles and, and to really feel like you were going to, you know, move this forward? How long did that process take? I might throw that to Joe Baker if he's still yeah. with us. Okay. Can you, can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Well, as I mentioned earlier uh, in the call, we really started on this in 2017. So began the, really the process from uh, initial conversation to getting a bus signed off on and authorized to run a route um, took us almost 18 months. Now, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, there was no playbook. We were really just putting the team together. But, you know, I, I think... Um, I think that's critical up front is to identify who the right partners are. And, you know, in, in the case of Connecticut, if it's not going to be power companies, um, you, you need to, I think, look at what are the right stakeholders that can, can help you get that done? I think, I think the important thing to point out, I think the funding part of it is so important. I, I really, I wouldn't, I wouldn't kid you to, uh, to say that that is probably the biggest barrier that you're, you're going to run into. So I think there needs to be efforts to lobby for funding, to get the community involved has been, you know, has, has been discussed as well. And just keep in mind that um, pri uh, private contractors, right, like, like Durham and National Express bid for these contracts. So they're competitive bids. 
And that's why we really need the school districts to champion the solutions here to help us get the funding to be able to do this. Um, and, and until that changes, it's, it's going to be very difficult. So we want to do it. Uh, we just need some help with the, with the funding part. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And I, I think too, you know, when a lot of these community champions and school districts start to do this, I don't think they always, you know, they don't always realize that it's, um, it's, you got to have a little grit and you got to have commitment. It, it's not an overnight process. It, it does take time. And um, my experience has been, especially when you're going for grants, you really have to have your team together and sort of a project plan in place and be ready for those grant opportunities. I think what I hear sometimes is people say, well, you know, we can't afford the buses and so we're going to wait for a grant. Well, you really can't wait for the grant to start getting ready for the project, right? You have to really form the team, have the vision, have the commitment, go for it and figure out that project plan. And then, you know, as you're saying, you know, you look for the grants, you look for potential opportunities um, and you, you kind of, you know, build this project and then also in parallel, look for those grant opportunities so that when those grant opportunities come, or maybe you, you know, you lobby for them or something comes up unexpected, that you're ready to go because those grant opportunities come and go very quickly. Those windows of opportunity are, are, very, are very slim. You gotta get right in there and you've gotta be ready to go. And so I think the message really is for any school district who, is, who wants to do this electric school bus you know, project, get your team together, start working on it and be open for grant opportunities, lobby for grant opportunities, and just really know that this is the future and that in Connecticut, we need 2,433 more electric school buses to meet our goal by 2030. And we congratulate Middletown for being the first town in Connecticut for having an electric bus. So congratulations to Middletown. And hopefully there'll be 168 more towns in Connecticut that will soon be joining you and be able to say that they also have an electric school bus. We are at the top of the hour. Oh my gosh, thank you. We can't thank you all enough, or we can thank you enough. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being with us. We have your contact information. I know other questions are gonna come into us um, after this, and I know that you're all available. I know Sergio lives and breathes electric school buses and he's always available to um, answer questions. So, Thank you all so much for joining us for our finale of our Green Wheels webinar series, Electric Electric. Thank you all so much. Have an electric day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Daphne. Thank you. Thanks, Daphne. Bye-bye.